Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Tata Steel Analyst Call. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. All the attendees' audio and video has been disabled from the back end and will be enabled subsequently. I, I thank you all for your patience and now would like to hand the conference over to Ms. Samita Shah. Thank you and over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to all of you joining us today. Uh, welcome to this call and thank you for dialing in. We have with us our CEO and MD, Mr. TV Narendran, and we have with us our EDN CEO. This here. meeting is being recorded. Mr. Chatterjee, who will discuss the results and uh, walk you through any questions you may have. Uh, our presentation, which describes the results, has been uploaded on our website. Do go through it if you haven't already, and we will take questions uh, in audio mode as well as chat mode. Um, before I hand it over to them, I would just like to draw your attention to the clause uh, on page two of the presentation, which uh, the safe harbor clause, which essentially will cover the entire discussion today. Thank you, and over to you, Narendra. Thanks, Amita. Good day, everyone. Uh, a bit of a narrative on the way we see the situation. The global operating environment has continued to be volatile during the quarter amidst inflationary pressures, tightening financial conditions, and the COVID overhang. And among the key economies, the US and EU witnessed a quarter on quarter decline in industrial output, while the Chinese GDP grew at its lowest pace since 1976. Given this backdrop, global steel prices continue to remain under pressure for most of the quarter and resulted in subdued steel spreads. In the EU, the steel spot spread, including energy and emission related cost, went close to $200. And in India, the economic activity remained resilient. However, depressed international prices weighed in on the sentiment. Moving to our performance, Tata Steel India deliver, delivery stood at 4.74 million tons and were up 7% year on year, primarily driven by the 11% growth in domestic deliveries. Our domestic deliveries grew at a faster pace than the Indian steel apparent consumption, which was about 8% year on year. And it reflects a strong market presence across segments and agile business model. Some of the highlights were our value added segments like the oil and gas infrastructure, solar and retail housing grew by about 17% on a year on year basis in part due to the expanding product range and innovative solutions. Tata Tiscon, which is largely sold to retail customers, registered a best ever quarterly sales. And we continue to expand our physical reach via new dealers and a virtual reach through Tata Steel Asiana, our e-commerce platform for individual home builders. And sales through Tata Steel Asiana have consistently grown over 50% in the last two years. Our sales to the MSME sector has grown by 25 to 30% year on year in the last two quarters. And we have moved from tracking six segments to 80 micro segments, which has helped us understand customers better and enhanced the ability to move material across micro segments based on demand. Looking ahead, we expect Indian steel prices to move higher based on improved expectations about the Chinese demand and the sustained government spending on infrastructure in India. The raw material costs are likely to remain range bound. Uh, uh, and fourth quarter is also seasonally the stronger quarter in terms of deliveries, and we're looking to leverage the momentum. We continue to progress on expanding our capacity across multiple sites in India as we look to grow to 40 million tons in India. And viewed in terms of deliveries, FY24 should fully reflect the 1 million tons per annum in large volumes, while subsequent years, FY25 and 26, will reflect the 5 million ton expansion in Kalinganagar Phase 2 and the 0.75 million ton uh, setting up of the electric arc furnace mill in Ludhiana. We are parallelly expanding our downstream operations at tin plate, wires, and tubes. Uh, the ongoing expansion in tin plate is uh, uh, from 0.38 million tons per annum to 0.68 million tons per annum. The wire capacity is being expanded by, from 0.47 to 0.55 million tons per annum, and the tubes capacity from 1.2 million tons per annum to 1.5 million tons per annum. Separately, phase commissioning of the 6 million ton pellet plant at Kaliganagar has begun, and we should stop buying pellets from the second quarter of FY24, which will help reduce our costs. We are also looking to commission the, uh, the PLTCM, which is a pickling line, and the tandem coal mill, which is part of the 2.2 million ton per annum CRM complex during this quarter. On slide 19, we have provided some domestic uh, details of domestic deliveries across sectors. And over the years, while we have sold more volumes in automotive, its share is also moved to around 15% of our total sales. And this is said to rise with the commissioning of the CRM complex and the incremental capacity at Kalinganagar. Similarly, the growth in long products will drive an increase in the high margin retail housing business for us. Moving to Europe, the steel delivery stood at around 2 million tons in the third quarter. Though the volumes were higher by 6% quarter on quarter basis, the sharp drop in realizations 
on subdued demand and elevated costs, including energy, have weighed in on the steel spreads. Looking ahead, uncertainty persists about supply demand fundamentals, despite the recent pickup in the EU prices, driven by the hopes of a milder and shorter down cycle. Our steel realizations will remain subdued in fourth quarter, given the lag effects of some of the contracts. We continue to make progress on our sustainability journey to achieve net zero by 2045 via multiple pathways. We have already started uh, initiatives such as charging more scrap into our furnaces. Our products like Tisco Bill Green Construction Blocks and Druvi Gold have has slag as one of the inputs helps us to achieve solid waste utilization as well as address customer needs for eco-friendly solutions. Before I hand over to Kaushik, I'm also happy to share that Tata Steel is the only company in India to be recognized by the World Economic Forum as a global diversity, equity, and inclusion lighthouse. And we've also been awarded a great place to work certification for the sixth time in a row. Over to you, Kaushik. Thank you, Naren. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those who have joined in. Let me give you a deeper sense of the financial performance. Our consolidated revenues for the quarter stood at uh, about 57,084 crores while EBITDA stood at 4,154 crores, uh, which translates to a margin of about 7%. So the standalone EBITDA margin was higher at about 18%. Overall, the profitability was affected by a sharp drop on, in the realizations and spreads in Europe during the quarter. So first, the standalone at Tata Steel Standalone uh, India, uh, the EBITDA stood at 5,334 crores, which translates to an EBITDA per ton of about 11,623. Excluding the foreign forex impact, the EBITDA stood at about 4,763 crores and was up by about 15% quarter in quarter. India steel prices remain subdued uh, for most part of the quarter. The fall in long prices, uh, long products prices were higher than in the flat products due to extended monsoon and the, uh, the stoppage of construction uh, in Delhi in the NCR region uh, as per the ruling of the National Green Tribunal. However, the raw material prices were also lower as coking coal prices uh, uh, declined by around $82 per ton on a consumption basis. The royalties also de uh, declined by about 14% quarter on quarter to 775 crores. Overall, the drop in cost more than offset the greater than expected decline in net realization, and that's led to the margin expansion. At Tata Steel Europe, the EBITDA loss stood at about 116 million, 166 million pounds. Uh, as Nareen mentions, deliveries were up 6% quarter on quarter, but there was a sharp drop in realization within the quarter with revenue per ton being down by about 159 pounds per ton. The sharp drop in realizations were part due to the higher spot sales and subdued demand given the macro conditions in Europe and high stock of, uh, high stock of inventories with the customers. The costs were higher by about 31 pounds per ton, while the cooking coal consumption costs were down by about $95 per ton, quarter on quarter. There was a NRV markdown uh, loss of about 55 million on the slab stocks being carried due to the forthcoming relining in Tata Steel, Netherlands. Energy costs remain broadly stable on a quarter on quarter basis. The currency markets have also been very volatile and there has been sharp movement between the USD INR and the euro INR, to name a few. This has led to an FX impact on the intercompany loans provided over time, and the result, and this resulted in a forex gain of around 1,427 crores at the consolidated level. Taxes for the quarter stood at about 2,905 crores, and are fundamentally made up of two parts. A, the current tax, uh, in line with the profitability in, in India, uh, largely, uh, and uh, B, the non-cash deferred tax charge, primarily due to the reduction in the surplus in British Steel Pension Scheme uh, as a part of the uh, de-risking, and I'm coming to that point uh, soon. We made further progress during the quarter on de-risking the British Steel Pension Scheme and expanded the insurance coverage uh, from 30% to 60% now. This buy-in transaction and the actual movement during the quarter have led to the reduction of the surplus, but it still continues to be materially in surplus. As mentioned in the previous quarter, the surplus reduction results in a reduction in the deferred tax liabilities in the OCI, but given the large amount of accumulated losses and the deferred tax assets in Tarsteel UK, we have to limit the movements by recording and offsetting deferred tax expense in the profit and loss account, which is why you see a non-tax deferred uh, charge in the profit and loss. 
Depending on market conditions, the residual insurance of what 40% liabilities will be completed in the first half of the calendar year 2023, and there will be uh, commensurate uh, non-cash deferred tax expenses depending on the size of the uh, de-risking that we do. Moving to cash flows, the operating cash flow for the quarter stood at about 5,000 crores versus 1,700 crores in the previous quarter, and primarily was driven by favorable working capital movement. The working capital release was due to reduction in inventory at Tata Steel UK and Tata Steel India on account of low commodity prices or lower inventory levels, but this was partly offset by increase in the slab stocks in Tata Steel Netherlands, as I mentioned earlier. As the slab stocks gets consumed uh, over the next two quarters, we expect uh, working capital release at Tata Steel Netherlands also over the next, uh, uh, over the relining period, which will be starting in April. We continue to invest in growth in Kalinganagar and in NINL, taking our capital expenditure to about 3,632 crores for the quarter. The nine months CapEx has been about 9,746 crores, and we will be targeting to spend around 3,000 crores in quarter four to ensure that we accelerate the completion of the Tata Steel uh, Kalinganagar expansion project. Our net debt has remained broadly stable at about 71,706 crores, and the liquidity remains strong at over 15,000 crores. We are uh, not able to deleverage in, in this particular year due to very high uh, volatility in the earnings and working capital. Uh, our focus on completing the Tata Steel Kalinganagar project, acquisition of Nilachal, which was about 10,000 crores this year, and uh, the best ever dividends that we paid over 6,000 crores. Even after this, our net debt to EBITDA is within the long-term target uh, levels of about two. Uh, our long-term target for deleveraging uh, continues to be the same. Uh, we will continue to restart the deleveraging in financial year 23-24, uh, and we'll continue to ensure that uh, our target of a billion is, uh, is fulfilled or met during that next forecast year and going forward. Looking ahead, the next few quarters are likely to be uh, weaker for Tata Steel in Europe uh, as markets continue to be subdued. The realization for the fourth quarter are forecast to be weaker and uh, drop will be higher than the drop expected in the coal and iron ore prices. Furthermore, Tata Steel Netherlands is undertaking a blast furnace reline in quarter four of uh, FI24. We are working on minimizing the impact on all of these aspects, including the working capital and margins. Moreover, there are a few specific asset challenges which we are addressing. Some of the heavy end assets in Tata Steel UK are reaching the end of their useful life. Any long-term solution in the UK also has to address the rising cost of carbon and the local emission reduction goals. The UK government has provided us a framework of support for the proposed transition uh, of Tata Steel UK to a low carbon uh, configuration. This framework consists of potential partial capital expenditure grant, uh, policy on electricity pricing, and regulatory intent to ensure a level playing field for green steel manufacturers. We are currently evaluating this offer of support. We are developing the options, uh, investment options, which will be, which has to be capital efficient, economically viable, bankable, and value accretive, which will be reviewed internally over the next uh, couple of months and determine the way forward. In the meantime, we will continue to run uh, Tata Steel UK optimally for cash with minimal support from Tata Steel in India. With that, I conclude my comments and we open the floor for question and answers. Thank you. We will now begin with the question and answer session. We will be taking questions on audio and chat. <laughs> Join the audio questions queue. Please mention your full name and email ID in the chat box. Kindly stick to a maximum of two questions per participant and rejoin the queue should you have a follow-up question. We will unmute your mic so that you can ask your question. To ask questions on chat, please type in your question along with your full name and email ID in the chat box. We will now wait for a moment as the queue assembles.
The first question is from Pinakin Parekh of JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Where the company had uh, effectively, you know, guided to a certain set of uh, numbers for the India operations and for the Europe operations. Uh, clearly, the earnings are far weaker than that. But it seems that uh, the um, the profitability is lower than peers as well. Uh, can we? Can you walk us through as to uh, what happened in the India business uh, in particular? If the cost reduction is lower than what uh, we have seen in peers, and how uh, how this will trend over the coming quarters? So, Pinakin, uh, 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 in terms of cost reduction, I don't know if you can be more specific, but generally uh, one area where uh, we had a slightly different issue in India is uh, we were ramping up Nilachal. You know, so if you look at it on a consolidated basis, you had the Nilachal business, which was incurring costs but not yet earning much revenue. Uh, that will get uh, uh, settled during this quarter because the production is coming up to peak and we'll be selling that certainly one area but otherwise uh, i don't uh, know of any specific area where uh, our costs have uh, trended differently i don't know if you can be more specific maybe i can try and answer sure i mean we were just you know given that uh, the december quarter the coking coal cost benefit that were that was supposed to be there the margin expansion uh, was probably you know markets thought that it could be higher than what uh, what we have seen so just trying to understand was there any particular uh, realization of contract sales volume issue uh, or where um, other than coking coal cost some of the other expenditure did end up being higher than what was earlier thought in november no when we had uh, met in november i think the guidance on the realizations uh, uh, were not as uh, pessimistic as it turned out to be right i mean if you really look mm -hmm. at we went into that quarter we thought uh, that the prices will had reached its bottom and will start moving up or if not moving up it will stay stay stable but the realized mm -hmm. q3 in india has been about 2000 rupees less than q2 right uh, yeah. so it was certainly so the margin expansion in q3 was largely supposed to come from the drop in uh, coal cost consumption cost the coal consumption cost mm -hmm. by 90 dollars a ton which is what we had guided mm -hmm. uh, in november mm -hmm. Uh, we had said 90. I think we ended up close to that. But in terms mm -hmm. of margins, uh, we had expected. Uh, we didn't expect the prices to drop as much as it did, right? And by the sure. time, it was uh, already uh, towards the end of December. And secondly, mm -hmm. we were also hoping to get the relief on export duty earlier than when it came. You know, it came only in the middle of November, whereas we had been hoping that it would have come earlier because the steel prices in the domestic markets were still quite low. Sure, sure. We actually had a pretty good quarter as far as uh, production is concerned, and I think uh, at least in India, uh, we didn't have any issues. Sure, fair enough. My second question is, you know, uh, just going back to Nilanchal, and you said that it was it has been ramping up during this quarter. Uh, now, if you look at uh, the medium term ROIC target of 15% on a 12,000 crore investment, it effectively implies a steady state through cycle EBITDA of 2,000 crores uh, from that acquisition. Uh, so when can we see that kind of earnings come through from Nilanchal? Because clearly at this point of time, uh, it is a material drag uh, on consolidated earnings. Yeah. So Pinakin, basically in uh, Nilanchal, we we were a bit negative in the last quarter, and uh, mm -hmm. that changed obviously because uh, one is we are today producing at least fifty, sixty thousand tons a month, and we hope to take it to eighty thousand tons a month of steel. I'm not talking of Hot metal, hot metal. The blast furnace is already at 80, 90,000 tons a month. Okay, so we are seeing the mm -hmm. work go up. The billet production is there, and we are selling the product at Strata Discon. So uh, next year, for instance, you will see a million tons of production out of Nilachal, right? So in mm -hmm. the return on investment on Nilachal was also based on uh, the expansion of Nilachal beyond the one million mm -hmm. ton. That the 12,000 crore valuation was not for a one million ton capacity. But was for the sure. opportunity for us to increase the size because if you look at a one mm. capacity, uh, you know we would have been closer to what we paid for uh, a Nusha Martin or something like that, right? Because they're mm. five thousand crores. What we paid extra mm. was for the iron ore, which has come at mm -hmm. premium, and we uh, paid for the land, which is two thousand five hundred acres of land. Uh, that's what we paid the premium for. So that. To monetize that, we obviously need to expand Nilachal to about four to five million at least, which we will do. Uh, we'll go to a board mm -hmm. in the 
months, once we've ramped up to 1 million tons. We were waiting for this 1 million ton uh, operating rate to be reached uh, before we go and mm -hmm. for more capital to expand in Latin. Understood. This is very helpful. Thank you very much. The next question is from Amit Dixit of ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. I have uh, two questions. The first one is essentially on the uh, on the non cash deferred tax uh, 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 payment or you know provision in uh, in the consolidated numbers. So, is it possible that theoretically, if uh, there is profit, you know, in uh, in Tata Steel Europe, then this can be offset at a later date. So, theoretically, we can get a lower tax rate. Or is it that uh, the profit has to be Tata Steel UK for the offset thing to take place? Yeah, I mean, the offset has to be in the entity which uh, is carrying this, which is Tata Steel UK. Okay, okay. The second question relates to the uh, spreads in uh, in TAC. Now, while in the prepared remarks, uh, you have mentioned that, you know, the drop in realization uh, would be higher than the uh, the benefits of cooking coal and stroke iron ore escalation, whatever is there. Now, will there be any NRV provisions in this quarter as well, given that prices have moved up in Europe, uh, 55 million was what was recorded in last quarter. Will there be something in this quarter also? And uh, will we have uh, EBITDA, uh, more EBITDA compression or will uh, we end up with a number lower than uh, what we have uh, in this quarter in per turn, on per turn basis? So I think uh, to answer that question, first is we've kind of taken all the NRVs that we could uh, Estimate, as you know, the NRV is point to point. It is in the end of the quarter. So we had stocked up slabs in uh, uh, Imauden in Netherlands uh, in in anticipation of the blast furnace reline. And uh, as the blast furnace reline will take about 120 days, you had to had uh, have enough stock to run the business and service the customers. So this stock, which has been accumulated over the last uh, six months almost, uh, was on account of the fact that at that point of time, the coal prices were at about 450, north of 450, I know prices were also high, which is why uh, this NRV testing happened. And that's the, clean, the write down or the NRV mark to market is what we have taken uh, in this quarter. Uh, if the prices don't fall very sharply or significantly from here, I don't see any material NRVs. I can't rule out uh, small changes in NRVs, but not nothing material in that nature. And we are just now actually, the other thing is, uh, as I mentioned in my remark, both in UK and Netherlands, we're going to go uh, run flat out for cash. And therefore, if that is the case, then the we are also targeting significant uh, stock level reductions from uh, as far as practical to run the business. And therefore, the end March uh, inventory number should also look much lower. Hence, the risk of the NRV comes down. Great. Uh, now, you know, the one uh, one associated question with it is that the annual contracts that are going to be negotiated maybe from CMI 23, uh, the expectation is that they would be negotiated at a significantly lower level, given that what we had in CMI 22 and the quarterly contract that possibly you will enter with in, in March and all, you know, would again be at a significantly lower level because at that time, Russia-Ukraine war was there last time and prices simply went over the moon. So do you expect that contracts monthly contracts or quarterly contracts will be negotiated lower and therefore we can have this overhang of lower realization extending right into the first six months, let us say, of FI24. So, Amit, uh, uh, let me put it this way. The annual contracts that we had for last year, uh, most of them were in excess of 1,000 euros a ton. Okay. Uh, so this year, uh, while the annual contracts are at a lower level, depending on which sector, which industry, from maybe 100 to 150 or maximum of 200, but they're still higher than the spot prices. That's one point I wanted to make. Uh, secondly, uh, the uh, you know the spot prices are what is going up now. If you've seen it in Europe, also it's gone up by about uh, 50 euros a ton. The if you look at last quarters and there's an extension of Kaushik's answer, 
the cost of Q3 is higher than the cost of Q2 because of these NRV provisions. So, so despite the coal being $90 per ton cheaper and iron ore being $20 per ton cheaper, our cost is 31 pounds per ton higher in Q3 compared to Q2 only because of this NRV provision. So when you look at Q4, we expect that the realizations in Europe will be about 70 pounds per ton lower than uh, Q3, but we expect cost to be at least 100 pounds per ton lower on a Q3 to Q4 basis. So we see a margin expansion per ton uh, uh, this quarter. Of course, we are still looking at uh, gas prices and many other moving parts uh, just now. But uh, you know, at least from a margin per ton or a bit per ton point of view, hopefully the worst is behind us for uh, uh, as far as uh, Q3 is concerned. Uh, now, going forward, the stocks that Kaushik said, basically we had to build about 700,000 tons of stock. That will start getting converted into cash. Uh, while the blast furnace will be down, the sales will not be down to the extent of what production is down. And that's what these slab stocks are going to do. So, uh, uh, and since that NRV projection has been, NRV correction has been done for the slab stocks, if the spot prices and the steel prices keep going up, we shouldn't have a problem. Before we take the next question, I would like to remind the participants to please limit your audio questions to two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, you are requested to post it the same in the chat box. The next question is from Indrajit Agarwal of CLSA. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, hi, thank you. I have two questions. First, if you can uh, give us some indication as to what would be the relining capex and how long would the shutdown be? And in lieu of that, what is our cash fixed cost per ton in, in uh, Europe? So at what EBITDA levels we will not need support from India? That is my first question. So, so I think uh, the blast furnace shutdown is planned at about uh, 120 days. Um, and the uh, cash part of it is already, it's not the new cash will uh, all, also come in, but it's a question of uh, also ordering has also been done over the last uh, one year. Uh, so some part of the cash has already gone out and there will be some spend of obviously as the relining happens because that's the period. And uh, it is uh, in the ballpark of about 250 to 275 million euros and that is the of which some of it has already been spent and uh, some will be spent and i think if i can put it the reverse way the tarsi netherlands is actually sitting on 600 million euros of cash so they don't require any money from india and uh uk would still need the cash infusion so that's why i said that in my um, comments that we would look at running it on uh for cash uh and uh, it, we will minimize as much as we can. We'll be looking at driving it and in, including in this quarter, there's almost about 1,000 crores of working capital release. So we will continue to uh, push that very hard. Sure, thank you. My second question is on coking coal. While we understand your uh, fourth quarter guidance, but given the news flows around you, uh, Australia, China trade opening up, how do you see coking coal prices trending on a more like six, nine month basis from here? So I think uh, coking coal is obviously not as liquid a market as uh, one would like it to be, and hence it's very vulnerable to these fluctuations. But generally, we do see, uh, you know, unless there's a, what do you call it, uh, an odd event like the Russia-Ukraine situation, otherwise we see coking coal prices between $250 and $350. You know, it'll fluctuate in that range. Uh, there would be some weather event in Australia for which it may spike up or something else. But we are not seeing coking coal prices drop uh, much below 250 uh, in the short term or medium term because honestly, uh, there are not so many investments being made in coking coal because generally coal is seen as a bad uh, basket to invest in. So this is where the challenge is, but I think this is the range at which we see coking coal prices. Today, it's gone up closer to 350. Uh, you know, your question on China buying coking coal, uh, well, I think one thing which China has done well is they managed for the last few years without buying Australian coking coal. So, uh, you know, they managed to get the quality they wanted out of the facilities that they have. They've also been buying out of Russia. So I'm not sure it will make such a material difference. Uh, 
as it would have done three, four years back because they've developed alternate sources over the last few years. Sure, thank you. The next question is from Satyadeep Jain of Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, a couple of uh, questions on Europe. Uh, uh, first on uh, the profitability, uh, I believe a couple of years ago, uh, the company was embarking on transformation program. At that time, the thought was that at uh, the spreads of about 240 euro per ton, the company uh, was looking at being cash uh, break even. Uh, given the current spreads are also about uh, 200 uh, uh, euro per ton, uh, not too far from there. At, the, at these levels, uh, the company should have been uh, possibly be at least a bit of break even. Um, is there something, uh, maybe is the Europe, the UK plants uh, reaching end of life or is there anything else going on? Uh, that is uh, uh, leading to that deviation from the targeted transformation plan savings? That's the first question. Yeah. So, Satyadeep, I think uh, two things. One is, of course, uh, our traditional view of spreads now needs to get corrected for uh, energy costs and gas costs because traditionally energy and gas was hardly and carbon together was less than 10% of the raw material costs, uh, whereas it went up last year to almost 40%. Right, so it played a very material role. Now it is coming back to around 10 to 20 percent, so it's at a more reasonable level. Uh, so that is one thing. That's why what we had traditionally seen as 225 and 250 euro spreads were assuming that uh, gas and energy prices won't be as high as it is today. So that is one uh, one change. Second point is uh, if you really split the UK and Netherlands, the Netherlands business has traditionally been a bit da positive cash positive for sure every year uh, and pretty much all quarters. So it's only last quarter is one of those quarters where uh, it was a bit da negative, but largely because of the NRB provisions that we had to make on the slab stock, which itself was uh, unusual situation as a built up to the last one I shut down. UK is where we have a challenge because energy costs have always been high and it's become even higher. Uh, we have some challenges on end of life. So what happens in an end of life situation is the Production levels are also not uh, as stable as we would like it to be, and that leads to unplanned uh, outages. So uh, that's something that we are uh, dealing with. So a lot of the underperformance has been in UK for the last quarter. The Netherlands uh, also has not had uh, as good a quarter as they would normally have. So we expect uh, in Netherlands at least, uh, you know, obviously uh, operationally this quarter is fine, but next quarter we have this last one is relining. After that, things should come back to a stable state in Netherlands. Uh, the UK situation is slightly different. Uh, cost situation is improving in both these places because energy prices have come back close to pre-Ukraine levels. Um, uh, so, uh, so that's the way we see it. I think uh, Netherlands should continue to be cash positive and a bit positive and should not need support from India. UK is what, as Kaushik said, we will uh, take a call going forward, what best to do. And the yeah. is, sorry, to come back to that, yes, it has... Uh, you know, it has uh, given us the numbers that we were chasing. Uh, you should also keep in mind that Europe is uh, today in a high inflation environment. So the inflation is much higher than what we had thought two, three years back. And that also has an impact on cost. So even if we have taken out a lot of costs, some of the costs uh, because of inflationary pressures have gone up more than we had planned three years back. Understood. Um, so the second question is on uh, CAPEX. Um, so the 250 to 275 million dollars for uh, relining, I understand. Uh, I think I was under the impression that this is going to be a partial relining given the eventual transition to uh, DRI sometime in future. Uh, is this capex for partial relining uh, seems uh, somewhat high? And secondly, on the uh, the media reports indicate uh, uh, possibly a one billion dollar uh, plus requirement for conversion for UK plant. Uh, uh, if I understand it correctly, the, the idea is to convert into a standalone EF given the scrap supplies there. Uh, the CAPEX required for a standalone EF should be, I believe, much lower than those media headlines. Is there a thought behind maybe not just looking at standalone EF, or possibly exploring other options there? Uh, that's those are the questions yeah. on CAPEX. Yeah. So on the relining, uh, depends on if you are comparing to a relining cost in India or something, obviously. 275 million looks high, uh, but if you compare to what relining costs in Europe, uh, it's comparable. 
Having said that, this blast furnace is expected to run at least till 2035, even in our transition plan. So that's why this is being relined for that kind of a life. Uh, the blast furnace, which will go down first, will be the blast furnace, which is coming up for relining in 2026 or 2027. Uh, so we have two blast furnaces in Netherlands. So this is being planned to be run till 2035, even in our transition uh, plan. Okay, that is one point. As far as uh, UK is concerned, uh, the media reports on the numbers are speculative. So uh, I don't want to comment on that. But having said that, the proposal to the government was not just about an EF, but it was also about uh, the hot strip mill, which was also coming to end of life, and some of the other assets which were important to keep the site sustainable. So that's why the amount was more than what you would spend typically on an EF. But given what we've uh, uh, got from the government, we are looking at what then could be the next best thing. What is the best that we can do with the kind of money that may be made available to us and the uh, you know policy support that we will get from the government. So I think this is what we are working out based on the recent inputs that we've had from the government. Thank you. Next question is from Ashish Jain of Macquarie. Please go ahead. Ashish, we are unable to hear you. We request you to please send in your question via chat. We will take it up in the chat question section. We will now move on to the next question. The next question is from Ritesh Shah of Investec. Please go ahead. Yes, yes, please. Yep. Uh, hi, sir. A couple of questions. Uh, sir, first is, can you uh, broadly give us some color on uh, the assets that we have in Europe? I think in the prior question, you indicated uh, there are two furnaces in the Netherlands. Uh, one, uh, uh, what is due for relining? It will be till 2035. Uh, the other blast furnace, it has its relining due by 2026. Uh, is, is that right? Yeah, that's right. 2026, right. 2027, around that time. Correct. Uh, sir, how should we understand the same uh, aspect for the UK operations wherein you indicate there are many assets uh, reaching end of useful life? And if you could please put in perspective uh, what you indicated that the framework that you are engaging with the UK government on practical grant level playing field, I, I don't know whether it refers to CBAM or something else. Uh, if you could marry both those uh, uh, verticals together, it would be great, sir. Sure. So in UK, if you look at, uh, so one of the blast furnaces in the UK got relined about five, six years back, okay, or maybe 10 years back, in 2012, yeah. I think it was. Uh, so typically a blast furnace, once it's relined, will run for anything from 15 years to 20 years. So there is one blast furnace which can go on for slightly longer. The other is uh, due uh, sooner. But more than the blast furnaces in UK, it's the coke ovens, it's the steel melt shops. There are many parts of the UK business which... Uh, uh, where the assets uh, are a bit uh, old and needs uh, support. And that's where our proposal to the government was to say that instead of spending capital on assets, which anyway don't have a very long-term future, uh, you know, why don't we use that opportunity to transition into a greener process route, uh, particularly given that the UK has a lot of scrap, which is it is exporting. But the challenge there was uh, the energy cost in UK, even before Ukraine, was twice the energy costs in uh, Europe. So our ask uh, of the government was 50%, at least 50% of the capex uh, that we need to spend should be supported and there should be policy support on energy costs so that we are not, uh, you know, disadvantaged compared to Europe. And, uh, you know, and uh, thirdly, of course, uh, the policy support that European steel companies are getting in terms of carbon border adjustment mechanism, et cetera. The ask in general in Europe by steel companies of governments is typically on these principles that at least 50% of the capex uh, that is required should be supported as grants because uh, the industry through its cash flows uh, cannot justify spending all the capex that it needs for this transition. And secondly, OPEC support because when you transition from coal to gas and hydrogen, uh, your input costs are less dependent on steel prices. When you're looking at metallurgical coal, there's a correlation between the metallurgical coal price and the steel price. But when you're starting to use gas and hydrogen, uh, the correlation is not there because gas and hydrogen are used for other applications as well. So the ask of the government is to also say that how do you protect the industry if it's changing from one consumable to another, which is more vulnerable to 
uh, other industries. The uh, third point, of course, in Europe is about the carbon border adjustment mechanism. But the last point is that we are also saying that there should be a level playing field, not only in terms of carbon border adjustment mechanism, but if there are some countries in Europe supporting their steel industry with, let's say, 50% of capex, then the other countries also need to consider that because otherwise, at the end of the transition, some of the steel companies in Europe will be disadvantaged compared to somebody else who's got more support from the government. So that has also been an ask on the principle of support. Uh, and this is what is actually being discussed by us and our peers with the multiple governments that we op- in the countries that we operate in. Right. Uh, sir, thanks. Thanks for the details. Uh, sir, if I had to conclude on that point, uh, what is the aspirational ROI uh, in the presentation? We indicate 15%. So for standalone, whatever we do for UK operations, even factoring 15, 50% hypothetically, hypothetically, the government uh, does contribute to the capex. Uh, what is the ROI that we are looking at at corresponding cost of capital? Uh, just, just trying to make sense of the incremental ROC. So uh, on that, Ritesh, it's more uh, linked to the cost of capital. So what works for in India, for example, our VAC uh, hurdles are more around 12%. Uh, but in Europe, it will be around 10%, 9-10%. That's the IRR hurdle for approval of CAPEX. But the ROIC that we are looking for is always at about 15%. Sure, uh, that's very useful. And I had a couple of questions for India operations. Uh, first is, uh, uh, do we see leeway to increase uh, local steel prices? I'm more referring to from an import parity math standpoint. Uh, second is volume guidance, if it, if it's possible on FY25 basis, given uh, I think the street will start to look at the company on 25 basis. And third is basically iron ore merchant sales. Uh, is there an optionality that the company has uh, over here, uh, if at all, if you could detail uh, any any plans on this particular aspect. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I think uh, steel prices uh, is in India is also reflecting the trends in uh, international prices. If you look at prices in Southeast Asia, they've gone up $100 in the last four weeks. And uh, steel prices in India, uh, you know, we expect it to go up by that amount over January, February, and certainly by March. Uh, so that's something which is mirroring what's happening in the international markets. The demand in India has been strong. There was in between a few shipments of imports which came in from Russia, et cetera, but I don't see imports as a big uh, threat just yet. In between, Japan was exporting a lot because the yen had gone to 145. The yen has also strengthened. So I think we are in a much better situation today as far as import threats are concerned than we were two, three months back. And I also think in any case, the steel prices in India need to find a better balance than we've seen in the last uh, three, four months. I think that's reflected in the financials of the steel companies over the last uh, two quarters, right? And particularly if the industry needs to invest for growth, we need better cash flows than we've got in the last uh, two quarters. So that's as far as steel prices are concerned. Uh, uh, Sorry, what was the... so I think there was a question on volumes. Yeah. So Ritesh, as, as you know, we uh, don't give annual volumes uh, in the December. In, you know, in, at this time, we will do that once we finalized our annual plan. But maybe you can just walk in through the broad sense of yeah. how we expect. Volumes. So in terms of volumes next year, you will see Nilachal at full one million. Uh, you know, we, we've not seen much of Nilachal this year because we started the plant uh, within three months of acquiring it. But uh, pretty much the steel making started in November. And, uh, you know, we are today, in fact, yesterday was the highest ever production uh, that Nilachal has ever had. We produced 3,200 tons uh, of steel yesterday in Nilachal. So that means the going rate is already at the rated capacity, right? So that is the incremental volume which will surely come for la- next year. We will also get some incremental volume out of the Kalinganagar. We have a new caster coming in uh, that should be up. Uh, and Kalinganagar also uh, today is actually producing at over 300,000 tons a month, which is like 3.6 million rate. So we'll get some additional volumes from the caster. We'll give guidance, uh, uh, you know, when we do the uh, annual results. Uh, these are the, and through some debottlenecking, we'll get some volumes out. But how much more we will guide you in the next call. In two years, we will have the Ludhiana plant also up, which is 0.75 million. And uh, by which time the Kalinganagar blast furnace should have also started. The next question is from Kirtan Mehta of BOB Capital. Please go ahead. 
in this opportunity. <clears throat> Just continuing on the previous question, you given some color on FY24 numbers. To get some more color on FY25, which is likely to be the valuation base for the street, could you walk us through the ramp up sequence of Palinganagar expansion, post expansion? How long would it take to ramp up to a full capacity? So next year, what you will see is uh, firstly the pellet plant. Uh, would have ramped up by the end of uh, the first quarter, which means we don't need to buy any more pellets, uh, which means there's a cost saving for Tata Steel. Secondly, we uh, the cold rolling mill, uh, not the galvanizing line, but the cold rolling mill will be ready. So we will have what we call full hard CR, which can be sold. So basically the hot roll coil gets converted into cold roll. So there's no incremental volume, but there's incremental value, which comes in from that. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, if we have the new caster in by the middle of next year, we will get some additional volumes from steel make because today we make more hot metal than the steel mill shops can consume. So these are the areas where you will uh, see the ramp up. Uh, the blast furnace of Kalinganagar should come up only in FY25. And that's when you will see the ramp up. Typically blast furnaces ramp up fast unless you have a problem. Uh, the hot ship mill and the steel mill shops would also be ready. And uh, once you have the steel, once you have the blast furnace making hot metal, ramping up the steel mill shop and the hot strip mill is not an issue. If you remember the Kalinganagar phase one ramp up was one of the fastest for any greenfield site. I think we did it in about 16 months, uh, the full ramp up. Uh, so that's typically what it would take. Uh, you know, we should keep in mind that this is going to be one of the biggest blast furnaces in India. Uh, so uh, we will obviously ramp up uh, keeping the complexity of large blast furnaces uh, in mind. Thanks for this details. One more question from my side. If we look at the Tata Steel and its subsidiaries, there is a spread which has opened up to around 12 to 15% if we take the conversion ratios in account. So in effect, if at all we back look at from this perspective, it would be market is pricing something like one to one and a half years for a merger to consume it from this angle. Do you think that that's a fair estimate by the market or do you see the merger progressing a bit faster than that? So, um, uh, Ketan, I think the uh, we are uh, at a stage where we have done the filing for to the SEBI and the regulators, and we will be looking at getting their uh, uh, clearances. And since uh, some of them are listed companies, I think a year uh, is is the ordinary course of business of the NCLT. We should be able to do that. I don't see it one and a half years. In Bhushan, we got delayed because of multiple reasons, but these are subsidiaries which has been uh, in our fold for long. So we are hoping that we can close it uh, before one year. I would now like to hand over the conference to Ms. Samita Shah for the chat questions. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Rachel. I'll start with uh, the questions on India. So we have a question on um, auto. Uh, we have said that auto sector is about 15% of our volumes. What would be the growth uh, trajectory going forward uh, for the company as an average? And what is our targeted mix from the auto sector for FI24? So obviously our growth in auto will depend largely on the pace at which auto grows because we already have a 50% market share and normally auto companies like to buy from at least two suppliers, if not more. So we are not looking at a much higher market share than we have today. So our growth in volumes will largely depend on the growth in auto sector. Having said that, uh, once a cold rolling mill with its galvanizing line and the annealing lines comes in in full, you know, what is coming up just now is the what we call the uh, PLTCM, which is basically the cold rolling mill. But the annealing and the galvanizing facilities will be commissioned uh, over the next 12 to 14 months. Once that comes in, then you will have uh, a lot more to add to your product mix. So while we have a very high market share, let's say in hot roll coils, uh, which is over 55, 60% in some cases, uh, in automotive, in cold roll and galvanized, we are in the 30 to 40% range. So there is a room for us to increase our market share in the galvanized, high-end galvanized and cold rolled uh, anneal products, which we will do over the next uh, three, four years. But overall, if you look at it, auto will always account for 15 to 20% of our overall volumes. The other sector, which is quality conscious, approval based, which you are pursuing in a big way is oil and gas. And I think uh, the Kalinganagar plant is ideally suited for the oil and gas segment. And we are making a lot of headway there. So we expect that also to account for a big chunk of uh, our value added sales going forward. 
Um, there are some questions on uh, the volume guidance that I think we answered it at, uh, earlier, so I won't uh, go through that. There's a question on iron ore merchant sales. Oh yeah. Uh, why do we not have? Why do we not uh, do some merchant sales if the optionality is available? Yeah, that optionality is available with the requisite permissions that we need to take, which we've taken. We are doing some iron ore sales, but largely our iron ore is meant for captive use uh, because uh, what we are producing, we are consuming. Uh, once the pellet plant uh, is starting, we will be using more iron ore for the pellets so, because we don't have to then buy pellets. Uh, but having said that, whenever there is an opportunity to auction iron ore that we can't use uh, because of the grades or because of the uh, whether it's fines or whatever, then we do that. And we, I think, I think one of the challenges today is not so much about auctioning it, but about the logistics of it. And I think uh, we have done quite a few uh, rakes of iron ore in the last uh, two, three months. Not yet so material, but yes, it has started. There is then a question on RINL disinvestment. Uh, given our deleveraging target for 24, uh, year 24 and ahead, uh, can we confirm that we are not going to bid for these assets? So I think what we've always said is our existing sites allow us the runway to grow to 40 million tons, right? So I think our growth ambitions can be fulfilled from our existing sites. But it will be premature for us to emphatically say yes or no, because this is a competitive environment. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, why should we announce what we want to do or won't do ahead of when we need to do it? Um, and there's another question on India, which says, um, can we assume a 16,000 ton, uh, 16,000 EBITDA per ton for Q4? So, as you all know, we don't give a quarterly guidance, so we'll not comment on that. Um, just moving to Europe, um, there's a question that do we expect steel prices in Europe to benefit if uh, the Kabam proposals are implemented? Yes, certainly, because, uh, uh, you know, we should keep in mind uh, that in Europe today we pay 80 euros per ton for uh, CO2. I mean, obviously, we get free allowances. Uh, so even despite that, I think we pay something like 100 million euros a year it doesn't cover fully uh, so the because the free allowances we get are not uh, doesn't cover our uh, needs fully right so that's a cost any uh, we are paying and everyone else in uh, europe is paying today and as those allowances free allowances go down you will pay more so that's why there is a caban because if somebody can make steel uh, which is more carbon inefficient and ship to europe without that cost that's very unfair on the european steel industry if you look at Tata Steel in Netherlands, it is the second most carbon efficient blast furnace in the world. It emits about 1.8 tons of carbon per ton of steel. So for a blast furnace emitting that kind of carbon to pay 80 euros per ton carbon cost and somebody who's, let's say, 2.5, not paying that cost uh, is certainly unfair. So we expect that Kabam will come in. We expect that steel prices in Europe will reflect the cost in Europe uh, uh, you know, because some of those costs are unique to Europe and uh, uh, the industry will need that support. There is a question around the energy costs. Uh, so given that spreads have been, uh, or margins have been affected by coal costs and gas costs, could the company please report that line separately under expenses for both Europe and India? So I will uh, request you to comment, but I would just say, all of you know that uh, we give a lot more information than any other steel company in the world, actually, or any company in terms of the profit and loss details. But that is uh, a question. It will get covered in the MDNA when you look at the annual numbers. Um, the next question is uh, comment, I think. Are we regretting not considering divesting our international business when the situation was favorable? Will we revisit this in the next up cycle? It's a hypothetical question. Yeah, so more, more of a comment. Um, I think there is a question around um, debt reduction. Will, do you expect a debt reduction in Q4 FY23? So we uh, actually in this uh, third quarter itself, we prepaid about uh, 1,300 crores, but it got offset by the um, currency valuation. Uh, so my principle that I can articulate as a company is uh, we will look for all opportunities to reduce our debt. Uh, uh, as I said in, the, in my comments that completion of Kalinganagar is a priority, but uh, uh, deleveraging is also a very important priority. 
and therefore whenever we get opportunities we'll do so uh, we do have some scheduled repayments ahead in 2324 coming up so there will be a natural uh, deleveraging itself uh, and then uh, whatever we get uh, from a surplus cash generation uh, we would look to prepaid our leverage um, there's a question on the profitability of Europe for 4Q. Uh, it says your commentary suggested that the per ton will further weaken over third quarter. Can you please clarify? No, I I think we didn't. Uh, we said it will not. It will improve compared to third quarter uh, because uh, while the I mean our current uh, estimate is the uh, realizations on an average for Europe will be 70 pounds per ton lower in Q4 compared to Q3, but the cost will be about 102 uh, pounds per ton lower. But we are watching all the costs very closely, including gas prices, energy costs, which have dropped significantly over the last few weeks. Um, the next question on Europe is on UK. What is the way forward uh, on UK, given the package is inadequate? When can we see some concrete steps um, that you will take? So I think we are, as I mentioned in my comment, that we are looking at uh, a optimal model, which is uh, investable, bankable, and uh, fits the need of the of the company. Uh, this is not a Excel model analysis; it's an engineering analysis, and it's a technical analysis which is underway. We've been doing it in the past when we looked at, as what Narin mentioned, as the the broader configuration. Given the current offer of the UK government, we're going to look at it. We've already started looking at it, and uh, we will uh, come back to our board and uh, take guidance from that. So it will take a little bit of time, but uh, not indefinitely. Uh, what is the kind of annual contract negotiation in Europe? Can you give us a sense of how different it is? Compared to previous? Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, like I said, it's uh, depending on uh, the industry. Uh, it's, I think, in the range of 50 to 150 to 200 in that range, lower than last year's annual contract prices. But most of last year's annual contract prices were higher than 1,000 euros per ton. So I think it's in the 850 to 1,000 euros range is what uh, we see most of the contracts for this year, which is lower than last year, but higher than today's spot prices. The next question is on uh, Europe in terms of the investigations around environmental issues. Can you please give us an update? Yeah, so I think uh, largely it is to do with our operations in Netherlands. Uh, you know, uh, obviously we, we'll, uh, you know, responding to the various uh, uh, notices that we get, etc. Uh, there are issues related to the coke plant there and the emissions out of the coke plant, uh, you know, and a few other instances of the past. Uh, what we have done over the last few years is one is, of course, we have a roadmap uh, to uh, continue to improve the situation. Uh, having said that, I must also say, like I said before, that uh, our Dutch plant is certainly one of the cleaner steel plants in the world, but we are conscious about uh, the uh, feedback from the community and from the regulators and constantly trying to improve the facilities that we have there. Uh, you know, so that work goes on. There are obviously investigations going on. There are questions being asked, which we are responding to. We are cooperating with the authorities and doing uh, the best that we can. Uh, but uh, having said that, I think we are a responsible corporate and we will do whatever is the right thing to do. Okay. Um, and one question before we go back to audio is on the Forex gain this quarter. Um, it's quite a large amount. Can you please explain uh, this and provide some details? So this is something which happens every quarter. Actually, there are gains and there are uh, losses. So there is a Tata Steel investment in Tata Steel Holding, which is the holding company in Singapore, for and it is it is um, done through a debt mechanism. So whenever there is a FX movement every quarter, it is adjusted. Sometimes it is negative, sometimes it's positive. And this this quarter, as I mentioned, the uh, euro dollar and euro INR movements have been quite volatile, resulted in an FX gain, and that's been accounted for in the others. Thank you. Uh, we'll go back. Uh, I think we have a few analysts for the audio questions, so we'll go back to you in future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Moving back to the audio questions, the next question is from Sumangal Nevatia of Kotak Securities. Please go ahead.
So Mangal, we are unable to hear you. We request you to please send in your question via chat. We will take it up in the chat question section. We move on to our next question. The next question is from Tarang Agarwal of Old Bridge Capital. Please go ahead. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Hi. Uh, three questions from me, two, uh, two on uh, Europe and one on India. On Europe, uh, given that uh, your current uh, contracts have been priced at anywhere between uh, south of uh, uh, 1,000 euros per ton, but if I look at, uh, you know, the total cost, even if I eliminate the NRV of 55 million euros, um, the total cost, at least for the last four or five quarters, has been trending north of uh, you know thousand euros per ton. So, is there something that I'm missing here, or uh, you know, uh, from the point of view of how uh, it's going to play out on a per ton basis? But it won't be more than thousand euros per ton. Yeah. I mean, can I you, think okay, we'll have to get. Yeah, maybe we can connect uh, because I think the question is not actually very clear. The numbers we are not able to. Actually... I mean, I don't see the cost yeah. in Europe at more than thousand euros a yeah, time. So, so I'm not sure where that's coming from. Okay, I'll I'll take it offline. Uh, the second question is how fungible. Sorry, Sorry. I just uh, the only thing I can think of is we have a lot of downstream as well in uh, Europe. So I don't know if there's any confusion on those costs versus those realizations. Anyway, we can look at. Yeah, we'll but maybe Samita can yeah, clarify we'll more specific. Because, yeah. I will. I will. I will. Uh, the second is how fungible is the cash uh, between Netherlands and UK? So in the past, we when we used to run in the Star Steel Europe, uh, we used to use it in a very fungible manner. Given the fact that Star Steel Netherlands has a um, decarbonization project ahead of them. Uh, we are kind of uh, escrowing and ensuring that we have that capital because that will be a very material uh, investment that has to be done in TSN. Um, but otherwise, uh, cash moves freely across all entities. Okay, and my third question that's on the India business. Between BPR, downstream, IPP and automotive, if you could give us a flavor in terms of how the realizations are uh, different? So, uh, you know, in terms of realizations, uh, automotive contracts, the tenures are different of these contracts, right? So if you look at it, the automotive contracts are typically three months to six months, depending on the customers. Now, uh, so if you have a rising market, the auto contracts will look less attractive because the spot prices have gone up above the auto contracts. In a falling market, the auto prices will look better. So that always happens, particularly when there's a lot of volatility. But fundamentally, the reason why we pursue auto customers is that uh, they are not price buyers. You know, they look for buying from suppliers who are approved, right? So that means your competition is limited to whoever has the approval for supplies. And that's why uh, segments like uh, automotive, oil and gas are attractive uh, because you're not reacting to spot prices moving up and down. Right? Uh, IPP is where the volumes go because you have a large number of large customers, maybe tubers, uh, earlier cold rollers. Now there are not too many cold rollers who buy uh, hot roll coils. They are all integrated. But uh, these are the volume play, plus you have a value added play in that. Downstream business for Tata Steel is very big. There our policy is more on uh, transfer pricing, which is based on arm's length basis. Uh, but there is obviously a lag. So if you look at some of the price increases that we uh, take this quarter, by the time it passes on to our tubes division or uh, the tin plate company uh, on our arm's length policy, transfer pricing policies, uh, uh, you know, it may be a month or two into the quarter or at the end of the quarter. So there is a lag between that. But again, we see downstream, like auto, gives us stability uh, in, in, in the business. IPP is more the one which you will uh, leverage, uh, you know, when the, uh, you know, the stable businesses are picking up less volumes than we would like to sell them. The next question. Hierarchy, margin hierarchy to answer your question, I would say uh, on a long term basis, auto and downstream should rank over IPP. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Sumangal Nevatia of Kotak Securities. Please go ahead, Sumangal. This time, yes, yes we can hear you. 
Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, okay, first question is uh, just some clarification on on the UK uh, topic. Uh, the entire uh, transformation from BF to EAF. What is the estimated capex we are looking at, and what is the plan to fund the remaining fifty percent? Uh, assuming we get a fifty percent grant from the government. So I think uh, if you have heard Narendra a little while back, uh, our original ask. Uh, was for a configuration which had an EAF and also the downstream TSCR or uh, uh, thin slab caster. So and the rolling mill. So that all was the uh, was the configuration that we were discussing with the government, and we said for that we need to get 50% uh, support. I think what the government has given is partial of what our ask was. And therefore, we are re-looking at what should be the uh, resizing of the configuration uh, if to make it uh, investable and bankable and value creative. So I think this, these three are the foundations of what we are looking at. And uh, I don't think what we had asked for uh, has happened. And therefore, the original configuration has to be rethought. Understood. Kaushik, is it possible to get what is the ask I mean, in terms of billion dollars or no, so at that point of time, it was multiples of the 300, which, which we had got. But I think uh, let us not look at that because it's no longer relevant. What okay. is no relevant is what we will now work on and are working on and which matches up to the uh, partial grant that the government is willing to give. And then go back to the government and saying that this is what we can do at best. Okay, got it. But given that uh, uh, the UK doesn't earn any free cash flow, I mean, how will it? How will the remaining uh, part be funded? Will will they raise debt, or will there be some support from India entity? No, it. So that's why I'm saying that when you do the capital allocation, when we say, for example, say that this year's capital ex expenditure is say twelve, thirteen thousand crores, etc., we take every entity into account. It's not an in India alone. So I think we, and this is going to be almost like a new investment. It's not putting money into any current. Uh, uh, asset. So, so this will be, as I said, the financial closure of it will have elements of uh, government support. It will have elements of Tata Steel support. Some thing, if the existing business can give or cannot give, then it will be externally funded. So, it will be a combination. But I yet don't know what will be that uh, uh, configuration. Let's work towards it, and then we will certainly come out and talk about. It. Got it. That's very clear. And I mean, uh, just hypothetically, if if it's possible to discuss, what could be plan B here? I mean, we have, we've been in discussions with the government since more than two years now. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a fixed timeline we are looking to close this? And what is plan B? Is divestment or shutting down the plan an option for us? So there is a plan B, there's a plan C. But I think uh, unless we cross the hurdle on the plan A, now that the government has given us a uh, formal proposal or a formal support structure. Let's work on this and see whether we get to that. Otherwise, there are consequent plan Bs and plan Cs that can can go, go past. And I think to be honest, whatever we do, we also need to uh, discuss with the uh, other stakeholders there, the unions and everybody else. So it'll only be fair for us to, uh, you know, internally discuss before we announce whatever we want to do. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Before we take the next question, I would like to remind the participants to please limit your audio questions to two per participant. Should you have a follow up question, you are requested to please post it in the chat box. The next question is from Anupam Gupta of IIFL. Please go ahead. What is the outlook for NSR and uh, coal cost for India operations for the next quarter, for this quarter, that is fourth quarter? So, there must be net realization, yeah. Realization, yeah. Yeah, so the net realizations for this quarter in India, we are expecting it to be about 1,400, 1,500 rupees per ton higher than uh, last quarter. On, uh, I say this because while uh, from December, the prices have been going up, I'm looking at average of last quarter because October prices were quite high, uh, yeah. average of this quarter, that is one. Uh, in terms of coal, uh, the coal costs are expected to be about $10 on a consumption basis, about $10 per ton lower this quarter compared to last quarter. The other point I want to make is uh, this quarter uh, between Europe and India, we'll also have about half a million tons of additional volumes compared to last quarter. Okay. 
um and just one more question um so i uh, understand that profitability in uk will improve in this quarter versus last quarter what would you highlighted but let's say over the next one year before your any transformation capex happens um do you think it it can go back to a, let's say a cash neutral situation or you'll um continue to have some support coming from india or let's say a local level debt coming in uh, tata steel europe so, so yeah, yeah, yeah no so i think uh, we didn't say it will improve i think uh, what narin's comment was it will not worsen uh, is the point and as he mentioned and i mentioned earlier also that we're coming to the end of life of some of the critical facilities which will mean that there will be challenges and cost and we are trying to run it in a most optimal manner which will require the minimal support from india that is what our target is till we come to a decision which is relating to what we have discussed uh, fairly uh, at length in this call on how do we look at the future as far as uk is concerned so okay. just to clarify kaushik's point i said we'll improve but we'll not be out of the woods okay. <laughs> yeah yeah understand that that's absolutely clear yeah thank yeah. you thank you sir the next question is from sumangal nevatia of kotak securities please go ahead hello Yeah, so yeah, Sumangal. Uh, sorry. Uh, so just one pending question. I mean, when do we expect the commercial volumes from KPO two? Is it one uh, H twenty five or more like second half of FI twenty five? No. Firstly, from next year, you will have the full R CR, which is uh, also part of the commercial volumes of KPO. But we should keep in mind that this is value added to existing hot roll coils. It's not incremental volume. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Uh, incremental volume will come from the uh, next from fi 25 i mean some of the incremental will, volume will also come from the second half of this year simply because we'll have an additional caster in the steel mill shop we are still working out the volumes that will come out of it and we will give you that guidance uh, uh, in the next analyst call but uh, so starting from this year but most of it will start coming from fi 25 whether first half or second half i think we'll give you guidance uh, okay. when we meet when we talk the next time Uh, got it and and just one last uh, question uh, the europe i mean in the past we've said that 50 60 dollar per ton at the entire europe level is very cash break even considering the capex maintenance capex and interest obligations i mean when do we see uh, we reaching to that level is it more towards the end of fi 24 or more like an fi 25 uh, uh, as we see today when you say europe i think netherlands is what what you just mentioned and as far as uk is concerned the uh levels are uh, somewhere a little higher than that so yeah. netherlands has always been ebitda positive okay. cash positive yeah. so uh, i think last quarter was an exception of being uh, ebitda negative uh, okay. but otherwise on an annual basis even last year and next year they will be uh, uh, ebitda positive for sure uh, in terms of cash positive of course next year we have the post lining post lining it will come back yeah. yeah so netherlands is not the challenge the challenge is obviously in the uk got it uh, thanks and all the best thank you the next question is from prashant kota of mk go global prashant please go ahead uh stable qoq despite such challenges sir my question is uh, if we uh, more on the coking coal side and the structural issue over there sir so uh, you have been used to buying this coking coal and uh, for very high prices and uh, uh in fact sorry for that word but arm twisting to an extent by the other side sir if we take a step back and just look at it from an outsider uh, three steps back actually from an out, as an outsider so this is supposed to be a mutually uh, mutual long term relationship in which uh, b- both parties need each other so but here it is com- this this thing is completely one sided and uh, uh, and also i believe the <clears throat> 90% of the volumes are, so, are sold on uh, a link to the uh, index where the index is decided by just 10% of the spot volumes so this is this seems to be some sort of an anomaly sir so what can we do to take a step back and say uh, collectively we as in tata steel as a leader not only in india as in asia also in asia because we are also poor region uh, that collectively take a step back and say okay we need coal coal guys need uh, uh, need us and this uh, coal uh, we buy after making some profit on the steel so can we have a new dialogue or new system of pricing this as in 
okay, we can pay you this much based on what we have made in the last quarter, last couple of quarters, this, and something like that. The way we have negotiated with auto guys, you know, sir, what is the thinking on this, sir? Actually, so I think it's a uh, obviously in any commercial free markets, the power will shift from the customer to the supplier or supplier to the customer, right? So when steel prices go up, we get a lot of noise from our customers saying that uh, you know it shouldn't go up. Uh, and it's, I think, in some sense, if you look at the coal companies, they will tell you the same thing. You know, the issue is that uh, coking coal is not a very liquid market, unlike thermal coal. It's a very consolidated market. What is also happening is uh, you have the big miners and you have the smaller miners. The smaller miners are not getting the funds that they used to get earlier, the financing or the insurances that they used to get earlier. Because coal in general is seen as a bad word without drawing a distinction between thermal coal and coking coal. You can theoretically do without thermal coal. You can't do without coking coal for at least the next 30 years. right? So there is this situation. Uh, for India, we are very dependent on Australia as a source. Uh, we are vulnerable to weather or climate events, and that makes the liquidity even worse. Or two years back, we had a problem in the railways there. So these events happen which swing the... Uh, coking coal prices. The part that you made, point you made about the index is a point which the steel industry globally has taken up, both in Europe and in India, saying that the index, or most of our contracts are indexed, and that index we believe is not truly reflective of uh, all the transactions in the market. This is something which is being discussed uh, with the people who, uh, uh, who have, you know, issue the index as well as between suppliers and customers. But I think, uh, uh, yes, we have a good long relationship with many of uh, the suppliers, uh, but they are doing, they seem to be doing what is right for their shareholders, and uh, we are doing what we think is right for our shareholders. So I think we'll obviously have to find that uh, uh, balance. But uh, I, the challenge is going forward, uh, this is not a sector which is getting a lot of investment for growth because of the uh, uh, fact that it's coal. But India is already the largest importer of coking coal, and Indian steel capacity is going to double over the next 10 years and will double again over the 10 years after that. Uh, so till such time we have enough gas or hydrogen as an alternate to coking coal, we will be vulnerable uh, to the volatility in the coking coal market. Okay, sir, understood, sir. Sir, even now, without any weather event or extra, they are gunning for like 60% of that Asian benchmark steel price. They have always want like 50 to 60%. Ideally, it should have been 25 to 30%, you know, for everybody to, uh, you know, they make, let them make more margin than us, no problem. Let them make more ROC than us, no problem. Then it, it should not be that they are uh, making very, very handsome and we are uh, uh, making suboptimal. So that is the only uh, concern, sir. Being a mutually, you know, mutual relationship long term. That's the only uh, point I wanted to raise. So apart from that, uh, the net uh, uh, NRV losses and the inventory losses across India and Europe, if you could quantify that, please, this quarter, how much was that? In terms there of 1,000 crores? There was no NRV on, as far as India is concerned. There was NRV to the extent of about 55 million in the, uh, as far as Europe is concerned. Understood, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, thanks and wish you all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question is from Anupam Gupta of IIFL. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, sir, I had one question on iron ore sourcing for for you. So you have that iron ore mine at NINL. Um, so including that and the other mines which you have, can you just lay out what the iron ore sourcing will change like over the next five, six years and also include, let's say, once the existing mines mining lease gets over in 2030? So basically, uh, our uh, desire is not to buy any iron ore and we've not been buying iron ore. We've been buying pellets. Because we are, uh, we have enough iron ore to take care of our iron ore needs, but we didn't have enough pellets to take care of our pellet needs. But with the pellet plant coming up in Kalinganagar, which has already come up, and over the next few years we'll build another pellet plant in uh, uh, the Angul facility, which is a Bushan facility, uh, we will be self-sufficient in pellets. So hopefully, from the second quarter of the next financial year, we shouldn't be required to buy any pellets, uh, and we want to keep it that way. The iron ore expansion is being planned to keep pace with our steel expansion, and uh, so that will continue. As far as post-2030 is concerned, uh, as of now, we have about 550 million tons of iron ore uh, reserves for post-2050, I mean 2030, because uh, we have 
the Gandalpada mine, which is a greenfield mine which we uh, bid for and got, uh, which we will develop at a pace at which we need it. And then we have the Kalamang mine, which came to us from Bhushan, the Nilachal mine, which has come to us with the Nilachal acquisition. There's also Vikya 2 mine in Jharkhand, which has come to us uh, with the Usha Martin uh, acquisition. So all this put together, we have at this moment about 500, 550 million tons for post-2030. We will continue to participate in auctions as they come up going forward. Uh, we will also have options on our existing mines when they go up for auctions in 2030. Okay, okay, that's helpful. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. That was the last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference back to Ms. Samita Shah for closing comments. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Kinship. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us for this call. I hope um, a lot of your questions were answered and found it useful. Look forward to connecting again uh, at the next call. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.